This video was brought to you by Imprint. On Wednesday, Rishi Sunak delivered a speech in which he scaled back a number of Britain's key net zero policies and in the process upset a number of his own MPs, frustrated major businesses and, according to some, fired the starting gun on the next general election. So in this video, we'll take a look at the major net zero announcements, the backlash, the defences, and explain the logic and pitfalls of this electoral strategy. If you like our videos and want to support the channel, then check out Too Long, our one-off newspaper. It's a fun collector's item, but it also contains 28 pages of original reporting from us. There's a link to the announcement video and the store in the description, and pre-orders close on October 1st. Let's start by taking a look at the run-up to the news this week. On Tuesday, the BBC reported that Rishi Sunak was planning to announce that he would water down a number of key net zero related policies, with the speech potentially including things such as delaying the ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel cars and delaying the phase out of gas boilers. And it didn't take long for the criticism to start coming in, not just from Sunak's political opponents, but also from members of his own party. Now, in a bid to take control of the narrative, Sunak held an emergency cabinet meeting to get his new plan signed off, and then hastily arranged a press conference for Wednesday afternoon, much sooner than he seemingly intended. Interestingly, this all came just a day or so after former Prime Minister Liz Truss said in a speech that the government should delay a number of key net zero measures. Anyway, here are the key announcements that Sunak made in this rather rushed speech. Firstly, he reiterated that he was committed to the UK's legally binding target of reaching net zero emissions by 2050. But he also announced that he would be delaying the ban of sales of new petrol and diesel cars, pushing it back from 2030 to 2035, and pointing out that this is in line with the EU's own timeline. He also delayed the planned phase-out of gas and oil boilers and introduced exemptions for certain households, as well as pledging to scrap policies that would force landlords to upgrade the energy efficiency of their homes there were also some less controversial announcements too, including increasing the boiler upgrade grant from £5,000 to £7,500 and reforming the planning system so that it's easier and quicker for energy projects to be connected to the grid. Now, Sunak justified this entire policy shift by saying that because the UK is over-delivering on reducing emissions thus far, there is space to take a more pragmatic, proportionate and realistic approach to reaching net zero one that doesn't risk losing the consent of the public. Now, looking purely at the politics, the calculation here is pretty clear. The government is seeking to make net zero a dividing line between them and Labour at the next election, buoyed by their, albeit incredibly narrow, victory in the recent Uxbridge by-election, during which the Conservatives made their opposition to expanding London's ultra-low emissions zone a key part of their campaign. The thinking is that if Conservatives can make the case that they're seeking to ease the burden on working people and families while painting Labour as the ones who will pursue a green agenda at the expense of those people, then perhaps they can eke out a victory at the coming election, just as they did in Uxbridge. However, this strategy may well backfire for a number of reasons. For starters, Conservative MPs and politicians are not united in this approach as evidenced by the response to Sunak's announcement. Even before he made his speech, a number of prominent Conservatives voiced their concerns about the rumoured plans, including Tory MP and COP26 Summit President Alok Sharma, Tory MP and ex-levelling up Secretary Simon Clarke, and even former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who said, We cannot afford to falter now or in any way lose our ambition for this country. And even after the speech, and even despite the fact that some of Sunak's measures were welcomed, there's still significant concerns about the headline announcements. Alok Sharma said he was concerned about the fracturing of the UK political consensus on climate action, adding that chopping and changing policies creates uncertainty and is bad for businesses and the public. While Simon Clark said that a lot of straw men have been offered up which simply weren't policy, referring to the part of Sunak's speech where he said that he ruled out 
taxing meat, compulsory car sharing, and forcing homes to have seven separate bins, all of which were never policies or ever even really seriously proposed. Meanwhile, Conservative MP and chair of the government's Net Zero Review, Chris Skidmore, said that there was a complete lack of certainty, clarity and consistency over what the UK's net zero pathway is. On the same subject, the head of the Climate Change Committee, the UK's independent authority, said that it was wishful thinking from Sunak that the UK could still reach its net zero targets by 2050 under his revised measures. On the flip side, there were evidently a number of high-profile conservatives who supported Sunak's actions, including Business Secretary Kemi Bardenock, Priti Patel, Jacob Rees-Mogg, former Prime Minister Liz Truss, and the Home Secretary Suella Braverman, who said, we're not going to save the planet by bankrupting the British people. Nevertheless, beyond even just Parliament, Sunak's policy shift risks further damaging the Conservative government's business credentials, as a number of industry voices have criticised the plans. Automotive giant Ford said ahead of the speech, our business needs three things from the UK government, ambition, commitment and consistency. A reaction of 2030 would undermine all three. While carmaker Kia expressed its disappointment at the changes, saying that it alters complex supply chain negotiations and product planning. Meanwhile, energy giant E.ON called it a misstep on many levels. However, it's worth noting that some car makers, including Toyota and Jaguar Land Rover, welcome the changes as pragmatic. Unsurprisingly, the Labour Party weren't quite so forgiving, quickly seizing on this sense of general industry discomfort, with Keir Starmer saying that a Labour government would provide the stability that business needs to attract investment, create jobs and grow our economy for working people. Now, despite Sunak's insistence that his speech and announcements were not about politics, Conservative Party HQ sent out an email of questions for Labour very quickly after his speech ended, further highlighting that this is a political battleground that they want to draw Labour into. Labour, for their part, responded to Rishi Sunak's announcement by recommitting to the original 2030 ban on new petrol and diesel cars, and pledging to scrap Sunak's delay if they win the next election. The party hasn't been drawn into stating its position on the question of boilers. More widely though, the UK has a relatively strong consensus on climate change and net zero. But this speech, despite Sunak restating his commitment to 2050, suggests that this consensus is being chipped away, and that the Conservative leadership hope to make it a major feature in the next general election. The real question for Labour then is do they take the fight to the Conservatives by championing environmental policies as not only a moral imperative, but also financially sensible and cost-effective, or do they cede ground to the Tories and water down their own commitments too? Or do they just try and not be drawn into the fight at all? Regardless, this is a super important topic, not just electorally, with the future of the global environment, our political systems, and even our wider social order at stake. As David Wallace-Wells explains in his book, The Uninhabitable Earth, climate change could radically upend how everything we talk about at TLDR works. And if you want to learn more about what Wells has to say, then the best way to do that could be by taking the visual guide to the book over on Imprint. Just like TLDR, Imprint is all about helping you learn quickly, conveniently, and visually. It's super quick because most of their lessons take less than two minutes to complete, summarizing knowledge from all kinds of topics and using Harvard professors and best-selling authors to teach you key concepts. It's convenient because it's all housed in their easy-to-use mobile app, letting you replace doom scrolling with actual learning. And it's visual because, well, look at it. Their animated explanations help you stay focused, understand concepts quickly, and actually retain what you learn. So join the millions of users learning with Imprint, including me. I'm taking their multi-day flow course right now. And do that by using the link in the description. Plus, if you use that link, you'll get a seven day free trial and get 20% off an annual plan when you sign up. And they'll know that you came from us. So check out Imprint, support our new sponsor, and thanks for watching TLDR.